Welcome guys to the show Pond Man. I'm your host Evan Kale. If you've never seen the show before, I work in the gold and silver business. I bring my camera along to work. I do deals. I make money. I show you how this business works and I teach you a couple tricks along the way too. It is a glorious Friday morning. It's supposed to be cold right now because it's October. It's like 80 degrees right now. So usually when weather's nice, the shop's a little bit slower I've noticed, but I have no idea what's going to happen today. Anything can walk through the door. So strap in. We're going to have some fun today. Hello. Mr. All right, so first thing, we're gonna check the markets. So I'm using Kitco. I got this question earlier, what am I using? I was using AppMax, but Kitco is a little bit better. AppMax jacks the price up a couple bucks because they're more of a retail side. Kitco is more for the business side or for somebody who's a vendor like me. Gold is 1926, silver is 2471. So I'll be buying silver today at 24 an ounce. I'll be buying gold today at 1975. And I strongly doubt any of these metals are gonna walk in because that like never happens. If rhodium came in, I wouldn't buy it. I don't know anybody who'd want to buy it and it's ten thousand dollars and I'm not sticking ten thousand dollars into something that I can't sell so I sold the tusk the walrus tusk that we talked about I sold it for six hundred and fifty dollars but there's a miscommunication and I guess the guy who owns it the old Somali guy who doesn't speak any English like he wasn't clear about what he wanted to do with it and my boss gave it to me but he wanted me to look up what it's worth and not sell it and I just didn't understand so I listed it for too cheap the Somali guy finally came in he wanted two thousand dollars I didn't know I listed it for a thousand because I thought that was a good price I guess I was wrong um, and the person who bought it was pretty pissed because I was like okay well I don't know I don't have this guy's number he didn't speak any English English. He usually comes in every other day, but sometimes I don't see him for a few weeks. So I just have to get back to you and tell you if I can sell it. It, it didn't end well. The guy was pretty pissed. I had to cancel the sale and refund his money. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this back on eBay but I'm gonna wait a couple weeks because I don't want this guy that I sold this to to see. I don't want him to leave negative feedback and he still could. So I'm gonna just let this whole thing kind of taper off and then I'm gonna relist this at the price that the owner is asking. And hopefully I can get it. How you doing? Yeah, it's bulletproof. <laughs> kind of necessary, what can happen? <clears throat> um, looking for some small gold. Okay. So this um, is what we have available for like smaller gold. What size are you thinking? Uh, I'm torn between a tenth and a quarter. I'll do these at uh, 195. What? For a tenth ounce. That's super cheap. Dude. Yeah. It's, a, it's uh, above spot. 230 going this way. Oh, you got, you got gouged. Come here, My, so I'm better. Better. The quarter ounce here is gonna be 500 just cause it's a limited edition War of 1812 commemorative. So, can we Sigma a couple things? Yeah, sure. So we'll turn it to silver, three nines, not four. We hit run. So let's do this bar, bar is good. Three ninety. Do you want a receipt? Nah. All right, before I waste too much time, let's see what's going on on eBay. As I've said before, it drives me crazy when I got a lot of stuff to ship out, I'm gonna race to beat the mailman, and then I got people walking in. Nine items. Ah, here it is. I got this Ann Klein watch I bought for a dollar and sold for, actually I bought it for less than a dollar. I bought it in a pile, you know how I do. And I sold this for a dollar plus three shipping. I better make like 50 cents on that. I bought this for $35, I sold it for 53. I bought this last Saturday. The lady had a collection that was about 50 grand worth of stuff. It says an Olympic proof. They make these Olympic coins every time there's Olympic games. They come in silver. They are very collectible when the games happen. And then after the games, nobody fucking cares about them. So this one's from 1984. It's just the coin. They come in fancy sets, but this is 90% uh, silver. I sell this for 27 on the markets. This is about 20 bucks worth of silver, maybe a little bit more. These are 30 brilliant uncirculated proof Jefferson nickels from the 1970s and 80s. There's 30 of them. I got 30 bucks because nickels aren't terribly valuable or rare or collectible. A 1955 mint set. We got a 1968 mint set. This sterling silver, I think this is turquoise. It's like tribal necklace, one for 17. I bought it for eight dollars. This love token from 1857. A love token is a medium green coin from the 18 and 1900s. And the backside is usually worn down with some kind of an inscription or something to personalize it and make it not a not necessarily a US coin, but a historic artifact. And then I also have a batch of a thousand wheat pennies going out. So let's package that up first. Five silver 
dollars. What are they worth? Five silver dollars. Let me take a look at them. Uh, 41 bucks. 41? Yep. It's a deal. Done deal. Let me get you some cash. Thank you. Here's 41 for you. Perfect. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, you come across any more, bring them by. We're always willing to buy these. These are 90% silver, as we've covered. Uh, I bought them for eight bucks each and threw in an extra dollar. So 49, it's a pretty good year, but it's not in great shape. Most coins, the averse or the heads is the important part. On the Benjamin Franklin half dollar, the reverse is the important part, the bell. You're looking for a crack in the bell and you're looking for what are called full bell lines going across here. As you can see, this one doesn't have it. It's pretty worn down. So I just paid the silver value on it. And this is just going in my junk bucket, as it's known, junk silver, 90% silver. I'll show you a good one to, to give you an idea. Here, y'all see the difference? This one's uncirculated, this one's circulated. I mean, this one's got some luster to it, but this one just glows. If you look at the back here, you can see the full bell lines. You can see the crack. I mean, this is a nice half dollar. I should be wearing gloves to touch this one, frankly. You can compare and contrast. Uh, so these are my junk buckets. Let me show you guys some cool stuff that I bought this week while I was not filming my show. These are all the items of note that I have pulled out. So let's start with this. If I can make money on it, I'm willing to buy it. This watch came in earlier this week. It is an what is this? An Invicta watch. I had never heard of it. I'm still learning watches. It's kind of one of the areas that I got to work on. The owner used to work with a watch expert, but the guy retired like years ago. So uh, the owner used to have a bunch of watches. I blew them all out. Most of them were shitty. Some of them were kind of nice. One of them was this like diamond crusted watch that he had been sitting on for like decades. And I sold it for $4,000 to a dealer in Florida. But so when this came in, I didn't know anything about this watch. I looked it up on Google. When you're looking at a watch, when you're buying it, if you look on the back, you you can type in the name of the company and there's also there's usually a four or five or six digit number on the back that's the model number so i just went on ebay because ebay is the best way to live price what stuff is worth it shows me what people are willing to pay for stuff and i checked out this watch this exact one i saw it going for 60 bucks uh, the battery was dead i work with a jeweler the guy that i sent that rolex to a couple episodes ago but he put a new battery in so i bought this for 30 dollars, and i'm trying to get 60 so i'm trying to double my money on this watch it's like kind of a nice watch too not really my style. This, as we have covered, is boomer shit. And boomer shit is stuff that only older people buy that is basically worthless crap. So this gold-plated nickel, I paid a nickel for it. Somebody came in, wanted to know what it was worth. I go, it's worth five cents. I'll trade you out for a normal one that you can actually spend. And they did it. So I have this on eBay right now for $2 with $3 shipping. And I have a bid. I have 40-fold increased my money, which it's only $2, but just, I like that math. If you ever see a piece of US currency that you know was never made in gold and it appears to be golden, it's just a novelty item. It's something that someone did aftermarket to put in a fancy set, like something like this. And they're just trying to mark it up and, and basically steal from people that are trying to collect. This is a Teddy Roosevelt campaign button from the early 1900s. I found in a back room when I was cleaning out some stuff earlier this week. It's part of the joy of working here is I just go to clean and I find all kinds of really cool historic hidden treasures. So this button was one of a couple that I found. I also, I've had this for about two months. This is a ridiculously high grade $5 gold coin from 1908. When I see these coins, coming in they're almost never in good shape and even when they are in good shape because they made so many of them it's got to be a really high grade for me to pay anything extra ms66 is a very very high grade i mean look at this coin it carries 125 percent premium because it's such a nice grade of coin like there's about 950 dollars worth of gold here and i had to pay 2300 dollars to get this now unfortunately that's about what it's worth maybe a little bit more i'm trying to get 3100 according to price guys that's what it's worth but like i'm not gonna get that this lady had a giant collection she brought in and this was one of the most expensive items in the collection and we showed her a gray sheet that had a value on it and this lady threw a hissy fit and it was like we were buying a lot of stuff from this lady and we were getting great prices on everything but this was one item she dug into and it was like we were gonna blow the sale if we didn't come up on price and pay her what she wanted on this so we ended up buying it for 2300 and yeah i'm not gonna get 3100 but boy i can sure ask it i think that's what's known as price gouging i think my father went ah it doesn't matter okay so i got some jewelry to show you this this is a palladium ring. This is the first piece of jewelry that I have come across that is palladium. Um, I almost never see palladium jewelry. It is used in mainly wedding bands. In fact, I think that's what this was. I paid 500 bucks for this ring. There's 26% of an ounce of palladium in it and palladium's going for 2350 today. And I'm trying to get 800 on it, but I might sit on this ring for a while. What's cool though, is it came with paperwork. And although the paperwork is bullshit and it's got a bullshit number for what it's worth, yeah, it says it's worth 875. It has never been worth 875. This is just an outright lie, but then it comes with paperwork. It makes it 
seem more valid. I can, you know, ask this $800 price. Final thing I wanna show you guys is this quarter here with a bat on the back of it. This came in earlier this week with a large coin collection and I was going to turn these away, but instead I just decided to buy them for the face value and I resold them for, I think 50 cents more. I had seven of them and I kept one as an example to talk about it. This is a commemorative quarter. They make a lot of commemoratives and quarters. They've done like the US territories, the US statehood. I'm sure a lot of you guys remember when there was all 50 states in the back of the quarters and they put out like four or five of them a year. So this is a wildlife series for American Samoa and it's a 2020 coin. Now when this coin came out, there was a conspiracy theory that this is the US government saying that they knew coronavirus was gonna happen and they, they discreetly are kind of flaunting it to the public by putting this bat on the back of it. Cause you know, they say the coronavirus came from bats and that obviously is not true at all. It's just a really bad coincidence that there's a bat in 2020 in the back of this quarter. We've covered commemoratives and there are definitely some very tasteless commemoratives that are out there, but the US government with like the coronavirus mint mark that I showed you, that's fake. They're not gonna make a coin commemorating the coronavirus. They're gonna make a coin commemorating something about US history. So anybody who tells you that this bat quarter is the US government saying that the new coronavirus is gonna happen is probably wearing a tinfoil hat. Oh, and I almost forgot about this Mexican opal. This also came in earlier this week and opals are my personal favorite gemstone. Just look at the red, look how this gem glows. Believe it or not, this is actually a very low quality stone. Only the Mexican and Central American variety of opal can turn red like this or have this kind of a red hue. And when it gets to be this kind of color, these are actually imperfections. This is, like I said, a very low quality stone, although I think it's personally just beautiful. 8.18 grams, which is 4.78 when you multiply that times 0.585 for the 14 carat. I paid the lady $200 on this. I set a price, she said okay. That's what it's worth, just just the ring itself. So I'm trying to get 600 bucks on this on eBay. And frankly, when I said $200, I was baffled that the person just said, okay. They didn't even say, can you make it three? Cause I for sure would have. There's certain things in life you can and can haggle for. Like when I used to sell shoes at Macy's, I would get these guys trying to haggle with me on the price of shoes. It's like, this isn't a fucking fish market. The price is final. But a place like this, there's always room for negotiation. Said it before, I'll say it again. If you come into a place like this and you're either buying or selling, ask if you can get an extra hundred bucks. Ask if you can get a little discount. Chances are somebody will say yes. I usually say yes. So I'm looking at my comments from the last episode and I got a question here that I'll answer. And the question is coming from Kieran Paulwell. And Kieran writes, hey man, I have a question. I know you said you're not highly skilled in gems and jewelry, but how can you tell the worth of a gem and the metal separately to find the overall worth of the piece? That is a good question. So man, I'm gonna give you a very unscientific answer. I'm guessing. Well, here, let's look at this Mexican opal again. So when I looked at it, I looked at the stone, I thought, oh, that's a pretty stone. It doesn't have very much weight. And really the only kind of gem that I'm gonna pay anything extra for is a diamond. And it's gotta be a quarter carat or larger for me to really pay anything extra. And like, I'm gonna look at that thing really closely. And if I see anything wrong with it at all, any carbon spots, any weird coloration, weird cut, a crack, anything like that, it's gonna really hurt the price. So let's say a ring like this came in, but it was a quarter carat diamond and it was a nice one. I would weigh it. The diamond itself doesn't have a ton of weight. It's not gonna really hurt the price or hurt the weight on it when I'm factoring a price. Like, let's say it weighed 4.15 grams. I might in my calculator do 4.05. I'll take off a 10th of a gram just kind of in removing some of that added extra weight. But then when I get the final price on, you know, let's say it melts at 200, it's in, let's call it an 18 karat ring. You know, I'll offer a hundred bucks, but then I'll look at the stone and I'll think, okay, that stone's pretty nice. It's a quarter carat. I'll tack on an extra 50. So what I'll do is in my head, as I'm looking at the stone and weighing it out and, and weighing the jewelry piece out, in my head, I'm going to think, what am I going to do with this? Am I going to melt it down or am I going to try and to resell it on eBay. If I'm gonna melt it down, then I'm not gonna pay anything extra for the stone. Why would I? I'm not gonna sell a loose stone. I just don't do that. It's too much work and I probably won't get very much money anyway, unless it was like, I can't, I just can't see me buying a one carat diamond ring and ripping out the stone and scrapping the metal. So really it's just a lot of doing guess math in my head. What can I buy a piece for? What do I think I can sell it for? Where am I gonna be comfortable selling it where I have a healthy profit margin? Now there are better ways to do it. There is a science to doing it. It's mostly because I'm so new at doing this. You know, like I've been, doing, I've been doing this for less than 18 months. And 18 months ago, I didn't know a goddamn thing about this industry at all, nothing. So this is kind of how I can operate and be proficient and quick and not get too bogged down on something and make an educated guess, shall we call it, where I'm really not gonna be wrong. I'm not gonna get burned on it. I'm going to make money. It's just a question of 
how much money am I going to make extra? Now this stone right here, I didn't pay anything extra for it and I'm trying to get an extra $100 out of it. Found money. So hopefully that answers your question. Great question, thank you. To be fair, what I really should do is get my GIA certification. That's the Gemological Institute of America. However, that's about $10,000 and it's a lot of time and it would be a nice extra hurdle to go through and I there's really no good reason why I shouldn't do it minus the price, but I'm also very busy. And thanks to you guys, this channel and my TikTok and just my social media presence is growing very fast and I'm very busy with it. And I kind of feel that I'm gonna get more out of growing my social media presence and putting my time into that than bogging myself down and getting a GIA when I know what I'm doing here. I got the boss's help. I'm continuing to learn through experience. I mean, really, I'm just, I'm like kind of not doing anything wrong right now. There's more I could be doing right, but nothing, nothing that I could really be doing wrong. Speaking of GIA, I've got a good story for you guys. You guys seem to really like it when I was sharing those stories in one of my last episodes. So I've got a lot of them. I've been keeping a diary that was kind of how I started getting into this or like I started realizing that that there was a lot more to this job than just working the job the story aspect the intrigue I mean I would tell my friends some of my stories and they would just be like god tell me more this is one of the more interesting stories that happened to me so there was this young guy that was coming in here he was about 20 years old and I'd see him every two three months and he'd have scrap gold to sell and he had his GIA and he worked at a jewelry store and this kid was just clearly a young hustler and I have a lot of respect for that this kid, like, I just, I really liked him. I liked dealing with him. He was very professional. He's very good looking. And just in, in having him in here and like, you know, dealing, doing business with him, I thought this is a great customer. I'd buy $5,000 worth of scrap from him every time he'd come in. And he was very amicable with the prices. You know, it's like, he's not getting 100% of what it's worth, but he would sell it to me at what I thought was a healthy margin where I could turn around and all the stuff he was selling me, I was mainly melting it down. So I saw him once during COVID and we were shut down during COVID. We were doing some business out of our, like front entry, we weren't letting anybody in the store. There's like a Hannibal Lecter jail cell slide where I can pass merchandise. So like that was how I was doing business. There's, you know, the glass is this thick, so I ain't gonna get COVID. And I was, you know, wearing gloves, washing my hands. Anyway, so he comes in and he sells me about 7,000 worth of stuff. He makes these comments like he hadn't made before. Oh, I make a lot of money doing this. I make a hell of a lot more money doing this than anything else. Well, a couple weeks later, when we open back up, you know, doorbell rings and there's this guy, got a very intense look on his face and I see he's got a badge and he walks and he's got the gun. And I said, Oh, it's a cop. And he whips out and he's got a file folder, opens it up and lays down a fucking search warrant. And turns out this kid has been stealing from the jewelry store that he works at. He's been taking items that were on consignment and ripping out the stones. I don't know where he was selling the stones, but he was coming here and a couple other places around town to sell off the merchandise. And the detective told me, $30,000 and counting was what this kid had stolen. And I about shit a brick because like I said, I like this kid. I did not see that coming. I mean, looking into his eyes, they looked a little dead, but I thought maybe that was just me. I guess I know now, trust my intuition more. $30,000 is an extra, you know, anything over a thousand is a felony. This kid's going to prison and this kid's young. This kid's like 20 years old. So I don't know what's gonna happen to him. I haven't really been keeping up with it, but yeah, this kid's fucked. And I just can't believe that that happened. Now that beckons the question, I'm sure you're wondering what happens regarding stolen merchandise and this is kind of what I wanted to segue into so with stolen merchandise I gotta ask you know I always ask when people come in I don't say is it stolen but I do say where'd you get it and I make um, I gotta make a photocopy of their license I gotta write down exactly what it is that they're selling me if they strike me as being sketchy you know again I can't profile like it's actually not okay for me to do that but if I see if I think something nefarious is going on I can either refuse the sale which I have done on a few occasions or I can make a what I'll do is I'll take the merchandise itself that they're selling me and I'll put it on my photocopier and I'll just do that and I'll staple it together. So as long as I create a record of the transaction, then I've done my part. There's nothing more I can do. Like I said, in extreme circumstances, like a few times I've asked people where they've gotten it and they don't, they're like, oh, found it. Mm, you found it, huh? Fell off the back of a truck. So the detective came in here, he had a search warrant, he looked around, but we didn't have the stuff. It had been a few weeks. We had already sold it to somebody else, another uh, scrapper that we work with. And at that point, it had already been melted down, it was gone. Let's say you stole something and you sold it to me and I didn't know it was stolen, I bought it. And I turned around and I sold it to somebody else and a cop came in here. Well, I don't have it. I didn't know it was stolen. I took that merchandise and I sold it to somebody else fair and square. I got money for it. Now it's that person's problem. I do have to give all the information 
information to the person that I sold it to, to the police, because it is their job to go try and recover it. It's, it's not property that was ever for sale. It needs to be recovered. So if you're operating a business like this, you absolutely have to take ID on everything with jewelry, with silverware. I don't have to take it on bullion or coins. That's that's about it. Otherwise, you gotta make a photocopy of the ID and anybody selling to me has to be 18 or older. And I can't help but wonder what's gonna happen to that kid in prison because he's for sure going to prison and he's good looking and he's never been in jail before. That kid's gonna get passed around like a playing card. Two people have been in all day so far. I haven't done martial arts in a while. I'm gonna dick around. Well, since it's not busy, I guess I'll have my lunch and we'll do the educational part of this episode. And because I'm gonna have my lunch, I bet that'll make it busy because it always gets busy when I'm about to eat. So on the menu today, we have a deviled egg salad sandwich. And on the menu today for a subject, we're gonna do something I'm very excited about talking about. We are not gonna talk about coins. We're not gonna talk about currency. We're not gonna talk about the US Mint or jewelry or anything like that. Today, we are talking about Beanie Babies. The great Beanie Baby bubble of the 1990s, which I lived through. I make it sound like it was a war. Kind of was. This right here is one ounce of gold. This right here is a Beanie Baby. Now, at one point in time, these two things were worth the same. Now, this is worth 2,000. That's worth about five bucks. What the hell happened? A collectability bubble. This story begins with a gentleman named Ty Warner. Ty Warner was born in 1944 and today has a net worth of $3.3 billion according to Forbes. He had a troubled childhood, he struggled to be an actor. He had a love of toys and he was a very meticulous guy. People remark about him, talking about him you know, way back in the day as being very unusual and just very hyper-focused on things that only he saw that nobody else could see. So he had a love of toys and in 1983, he worked for a company called Daikin and he was a salesman going around to vendors trying to sell Daikin toys. Now, what Daikin didn't know was that Ty was trying to start his own toy line, and on his sales calls, he would go and pitch his own toys in secrecy and was try basically trying to set up a competition to his employer. So the employer hired a private investigator to follow him and make sure that this was what he was actually doing. They gave him 30 days notice, they fired him, and they kind of washed their hands of him. Ty wanted to make his own toys because he had such a love of them. He particularly liked stuffed animals, but he had a lot of problems with them. One of the biggest problems he found with stuffed animals was they were too rigid, they were poorly made and you couldn't really play with them. You couldn't really pose them. They were just like, because they were so stuffed, they were just very rigidly made. So he set about creating a design for a new kind of a plush toy. He put a lot of work into it, a lot of design, a lot of research, and he was able to make these first toys at $2.50 wholesale, meaning the price that he paid the manufacturers was $2.50 and he was trying to sell them to smaller stores for $5. The company officially started in the early, early 1990s and initially it was a failure. Ty Incorporated was pitching to larger distributors and basically nobody liked these toys. But the thing that made these toys unique was they weren't fully filled. So you could pose them in different kind of ways. Now what he was doing, he didn't want to go to large distributors like Toys R Us, like big box stores or Walmart. What he wanted to do was put his toys in tiny ma and pa shops. So he, he is from Illinois and in the Chicago area, and in, like in Illinois, he was just calling up these small stores and seeing if they wanted to carry his product. And eventually some stores bid and were. Now again, it wasn't initially a success, but a couple things happened and it was basically just the stroke of luck that added up to the tune of billions of dollars and, and a crazy fad. And it was a two-fold stroke of luck. Number one, middle-class suburbanite housewives started collecting them for like their book clubs and stuff. And so it kind of became this game that started amongst these middle-class women that were just going around and buying these, these Beanie Babies and collecting them. And slowly it started to spread because people started noticing that it was you know, kind of hard to find some some of them. The other thing that happened was they had a manufacturing issue. They had a couple manufacturing issues when the company was early on. And in this case, I believe it was this one. No, it was Lamb Chop, it was a different one. A Beanie Baby that was a lamb, not this one, a different one. The materials for it, factory basically ran out. And it was easier to just say that instead of the Beanie Baby had been discontinued, they said it had been retired. Now by saying it had been retired, that caused people to say, well, 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 wait a minute, what do you mean retired? What else is gonna be retired? That created a collector's market. No, Larry, not now, I'm busy. God damn it. The cast of grumpy old men has departed. Where was I? Oh shit. He, he, he looked right at me when I said that. I almost, it's almost as if he heard me. That's funny. Okay, uh, what the fuck was I saying? 
Ty Warner. The retirement thing was kind of an accident. It was thought up amongst some Ty Warner executives on a lunch break while they were pitching Beanie Babies. And immediately, they had a much different reaction from vendors than they had had when they said a Beanie Baby had been discontinued. They realized that retired was the golden word. So they set up a very rudimentary website, which if you check it out right now, it's still active and it's very dated. Like it looks like it was made in 1995. And they would use that website to kind of give hints about when things were retiring. And by 1996, this was like a full on craze that had spread from Chicago all around the United States. So me being in Minneapolis, I got onto this fad probably about late 1990. 1996 when the fad was really taking off. And what would happen was Ty was very bare bones to start his operation and he made a lot of mistakes. And a lot of times these Beanie Babies that were mistakes, they'd do a run of them for, you know, they make a couple thousand of them and they catch the mistake. But collectors started discovering these mistakes and the mistakes are known as tag errors. So according to collector guides, this platypus right here has tag errors. Patty the platypus. There's a missing comma right here. It's missing the word UK right here. Nuremberg is spelled wrong. There's spacing errors. The it, it, this is what is known as an air tag beanie baby. And according to collector guides today, this is worth about $5,000. This fucking thing that I have had sitting on eBay at $5,000 with the ability to make an offer. And I have made offers to people for a hundred bucks. And it, it like, I can't give this thing away. I mean, I could probably give it away, but it's certainly not worth the quote unquote collectability that it's supposed to be worth in 2020. Now, back in the day, in the 90s, I could have sold this for, I don't even know how much. This is one of the rarest Beanie Babies out there. This silly thing that I'm holding. So collectors were looking for the tag errors and they were looking for variations. One of the most famous variations was Peanuts the Elephant it comes in a royal blue color. It is the most sought after, one of the most sought after Beanie Babies that is out there. They would do these little changes like that where, you know, they change the color or they would change the design. This one comes with an alternative design. This is the more common one. And collectors would look for the variations. They'd also look on these, they're called tush tags. They look on the tag down here. They'd be looking for a star. They'd be looking for spelling errors. So what Ty Warner was doing intentionally, well, unintentionally, but then intentionally, was creating this collector's market where, oh, maybe you have this version, but not the other one. And by keeping them out of big box stores, by only selling to small ma and pa shops, he created a scavenger hunt for collectors. and the mania. I remember I, you know, I was born in 1989. I lived through this whole thing. You would call a store and like, you know, you'd try and be guessing when a shipment of Beanie Babies would come in because a shipment of Beanie Babies would come into a store and word would get out that the store just got Beanie Babies. You know, they maybe put a sign up or maybe they wouldn't. And a line would form out the door almost instantly. And I mean, I witnessed adults fucking tearing each other apart from fucking stuffed animals. Interestingly, Ty Warner hated the whole collector market. He hated that his toys were so sought after that there was this market where, you know, a Beanie Baby might go for a thousand, two, three thousand dollars. People were quitting their jobs to become Beanie Baby traders. It was like, if you found out that a store had a Beanie Baby, put on your battle gear and get your ass in that store and buy every Beanie Baby that they had. There were newspaper ads that were taken out. There were robberies that were going on. There's even a homicide that happened. Somebody was murdered murdered over Beanie Baby. And the person who did the murder, the murderer is still in prison doing a life sentence. The craziest hysteria I remember was when Ty finally caved into the demand and they paired with McDonald's for these teeny beanies. And it was like, the demand was so, I remember going to a, to a McDonald's on a Friday. It was the Friday that the movie Liar Liar came out. Cause I went and did that. I went and got my teeny beanie and then I went and saw the movie. And I just remember the fucking pandemonium at McDonald's. And I remember looking in the trash and just seeing all these Happy Meals, brand new Happy Meals thrown in the trash. People would go order a hundred Happy Meals and throw the food away and just take the Beanie Baby and try and resell it. The teeny Beanie run was so successful, the McDonald's stock went up because of it. It was like McDonald's Monopoly, which remember how that went? Alas, like all good fads, it did come to an end. And largely what killed it is what created the demand in the first place. And that was the internet. See, on the internet, on eBay, prices were being driven through the roof. Bidding wars were taking place. At one point, you know, eBay was very new. This was like right when eBay kind of first came out. It's very fitting that we'd be talking about eBay again. 7% of all eBay sales were Beanie Babies at the height of the popularity. However, because of the internet, because of eBay, buyers could look and see in real 
real time what somebody was willing to pay. So there were all these publications that were coming out too, like Mary Beth's Beanie World, I remember was one that I used to, like I, used, I had a fucking subscription to it. And there would always be these price guides in it. But you know, fuck the price guide, you could just look and see what was being sold at what price online in real time. And that just makes the price guide worthless. So the transparency of that, that the internet and eBay provided largely killed the demand. And so Ty around 1998, 1999, started getting desperate and he starts retiring all these Beanie Babies. But he notices, cause it used to be when he would retire a Beanie Baby, every store would sell out and the prices would shoot through the roof. Suddenly it stops happening. And he kind of sees the writing on the wall that this fad is on its way out. On his website, he announces at the end of 1999, that's the end of it. They're gonna retire Beanie Babies for good and nobody cared. The fad was over. They put this one out, this is the last Beanie Baby of the original run. You know, all these people that had invested in Beanie Babies and dove head first into this collector's pond broke their necks. Now, Ty Warner did not break his neck. He made billions of dollars off of doing this. And I would strongly recommend you, if you guys are interested in what I'm talking about, read the book, The Great Beanie Baby Bubble. It's a really, really good book. And Ty Warner was such a bastard. He would lie to people. He would deceive people. He wouldn't pay people. He, he's he got this messy track record. He'd bring his wives into the business, milk them for the ideas and then divorce them and just kick them out and take all the credit for everything they did and they would get nothing. So today he is worth three billion and some change. He's almost never seen in public. He never gives interviews. He's a very mysterious and private guy. But yeah, he created this crazy, crazy fad. That is the story of Beanie Babies and why to drive home my point, collectibles, you guys, are very, very dangerous, even in coin form. You know, we've talked about some of the collectible items that I have here in the store that I'm selling. You know, things like this Buffalo nickel set that was an aftermarket piece. It's marketed for boomers, it's boomer shit. Or this 1988 Olympic coin set. They put out one of these every time there's an Olympic games, these coin sets that have these huge premiums when they first come out and then the Olympics happen and then nobody gives a shit about them and they just go and because they make so many of these, like they're never truly sought after collectible items, only by extreme collectors. And you, like, if you're investing in this kind of stuff, you're gonna lose your money. Now, it is not to say that all collectibles are a bad idea. In fact, quite the contrary, you just need to be very smart about what you're doing and you need to be perceptive of what's going on in the world around you. So right now, you know, when I first started doing this a year and a half ago, I started collecting coins. I had never collected coins before. And I stopped maybe about a year ago when things, I started to see the writing on the wall that things were gonna get messy. In chaotic times, collectibles go in the toilet because who the fuck has money for a collectible? Like you're worried about surviving. You wanna worry about a collectible? No, nobody's gonna pay for that. Only the extreme rich well. One collectible that did go up during COVID were comic books. Now there's a lot of pet theories as to why that happened, but just to finish my point and finish this segment of the show, if you're going to buy a collectible, never pay too much, know how much you're putting into something, have a price where you think you can safely get out, where you can get your money back and then some. Or if you're a collector for the joy of collecting, that's great, then it's your hobby. It is not an income. It is not meant to supplement your income or your retirement or anything else. Don't put your eggs in that basket. The basket will probably break. This book I'm reading is the Cherry Picker's Guide. It's all about varieties of coins. So it's mainly about like different kinds of mint marks to look for. Like right now I'm on Mercury Dimes. So for example, the 1928 S Mercury Dime has two different kinds of S mint marks. There's the common small S and then the scarcer larger S. And as you can see, the scarcer one commands quite a premium. Like we'll talk about, it was an MS63, this coin to be worth 275 in the common, 360 in the larger, uh, larger S, the more scarce one. And this is an area with coins I'm still pretty weak on. Uh, when I look at a coin, I can identify certain rare mints, but the varieties themselves, overdates, double dyes, stuff like that, it's still one of my weaker areas. Like, okay, so like this 1942, 42 over the one, this is something I could probably pick out on my own just by looking at it. Odds are I'll, I'll never find this coin. I mean, look at the premium it commands. An extra fine, normally be worth $3.25. This one would be worth $800. This is quite an error here. But but some of the other ones, they're more discreet, like scarce S versus common S or 1942D, 42 over the one, so you can still see the one beneath it, but they punched a two over on top. Most of these varieties, they're very subtle and the premium they command isn't gonna be that heavy. It's something that I need to keep my eye out for, for sure, when I'm dealing with coins like this. So I'm reading this book in hopes that I can identify everything that I see and cherry pick the good ones. I slept kind of weird. I got this spot right here. I got my massage gun. This massage gun is $300. It is the best $300 I've ever spent. And I'm a person who has bought a lot of good drugs in my life. Cannot recommend this thing enough. 
If you guys are wondering why I haven't been doing pull-ups in my videos, it's because I injured myself right here doing pull-ups. And I have to let the injury heal. It hurts. All right, looks like I got some gold coins here. Mm -hmm. What are we doing with these coins? This uh, one ounce, me? Yeah. This cut, this half ounce, this three piece, half ounce. Okay, so haga. We, we're trading? Haga, haga, haga. Yeah, he said there's one ounce in there, keeping it Okay, so he's an OS for half an ounce, and then we're just doing a little, look. we're going to do a trade, mm -hmm. if I can speak. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Not no. Gold Eagle? No. Does he know? Ask him what coin my, it my, was. Uh, you owed 1100 and you got half an ounce. And these are graded, so I'll just call it good. Tell him he doesn't owe us anything. Thank you, Baba. Yeah. So that's who I got the walrus tusk from. And thankfully, he brought his granddaughter translator today. Because he doesn't... He says Baba. That's about 80% of the English he speaks. Otherwise, yes and no. The guy's got a lot of money, it seems like, but he never pays for stuff up front. He always wants to put down deposits on stuff and it gets really fucking confusing because he'll be like, okay, I'm gonna put down a deposit on this thing and this thing and this thing and this, thing. like, he'll pay off, he'll pay them off piece by piece. But like, he'll show me his wallet. He's got the money to buy something outright. He never does, but we do business with him and he's been coming here forever, so I'm happy to do it. It just, it can get a little frustrating and confusing when he doesn't have his uh, grandkids here to translate and I've got something com complicated I have to convey to him.